Luke chapter 1, um, closer toward the tail end, we're going to read some of that. And, uh, and so let's, let's dive into this story together. And in order to get the context for the primary portion of this passage that we want to focus on, which is what's called the Magnificat, uh, which comes from Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and following. In order to understand that fully, let's rewind a little bit in the same chapter and start together in verse 26. And I'm just going to read through this uh, passage. So uh, would you join me as I read uh, the Word of God? Luke chapter 1, verse 26. 26, 2, 6. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? Since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Highest or the Most High, El Shaddai, will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord... Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, this is the part that we really want to focus on. And Mary said... My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her house. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for, again, your word, for the truth that is here, uh, for the story of Christmas. Uh, we have so many things surrounding us right now in this day and age that are telling us what Christmas is all about, and we are reminded that there's nothing that is more Christmas than the birth of your son, Jesus. We thank you for this uh, wonderfully detailed, elaborate story 
of how your servant Mary received the news that she would conceive through the power of your Holy Spirit, the Savior of this world. God, would you guide our thoughts, would you guide our uh, reflection, and would you guide our application as we think about this passage and and what it means uh, then and what it means now. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's an announcement, a few announcements, and we find finally the response of Mary that Luke gives us, which is a wonderful response. Wouldn't you agree? It's a beautiful response. Think about this. We know that Mary was a teenager. We know that she was not someone who was considered of noble birth. Uh, In fact, she would probably be considered someone who was kind of a nobody. Uh, on a number of reasons. Uh, one, she's a, she's a woman, and in those days there was not the same uh, measure of respect for women as there is today. Uh, she's also from a place, uh, a pretty obscure place, that is not uh, known to have someone uh, of, uh, of, of value or of honor to come from. And so there was no reason as to why she, was se- she would be selected to carry someone like Jesus to be born. Uh, She didn't have a special family name. She didn't come from a special line or lineage. But we find here that she was selected, and we believe that God chose Mary to carry the Savior of the world for a reason. And so as we look at this passage and we look at the sequence of events that took place between Mary and her cousin Elizabeth and the way that Mary responded, there are a number of things that we can learn about and think about as as our own selves. If you think about it, the story of Mary receiving news that she would carry Jesus, that she would carry this baby, is not unlike the story of any Christian today. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is simply this. She felt undeserving that she would be able to possess this truth, that she would hold this message, that the Savior of the world would come through uh, delivery, that she would give birth to the Son of God, to the Most High, and she was struck with awe that God would choose someone like her. Right? She didn't respond to this message by saying, oh, it's about time, Lord. She didn't respond to this message by, by saying, uh, by, 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 by thinking to herself, yeah, of course, I mean, if, if there was anybody, then it should be me, right? Like, I, you know, I'm a pretty good person, so no wonder God would choose me. No, she responded with humility. She responded in a way that says, I'm not deserving, I'm not worthy of having this special honor. But she said something that was very, very important toward the the end of her initial response, which was this, Lord, I am your servant. Do with me as you please. Lord, I am your servant. Do with me. As you please. Think about the implications of this message. Now, um, I know that there are some young folks here in the sanctuary, but, uh, but if you're here, then you're ready to hear the Word of God, and there's some mature aspects of the Word of God, so, and we don't shy away from that at Mission Ebenezer Family Church, but when she says, I have not known a man, she's talking literally about not necessarily having sexual intercourse with a man before. That's what the implications when she says, I've not known a man. And what she's saying is, is I don't get it. I've, I've never even, that's not even been something that's been on my radar. You, you know, I have a boyfriend, but we've been very clear about things, you know, and, and all of a sudden here, she's finding out that she is going to give birth to a baby. She's like, this is kind of crazy. There's a ministry that we support. We talked about last week uh, at our missions festival called the Grace Elliott Center, which is located right down uh, the road in, in Compton, California. And we've been a partner with them for a number of years. And the mission of this center is to encourage young girls who are pregnant, typically in circumstances that are, that are not favorable. A number of different things. I don't want to get into the details of how some of these girls become pregnant. And many of them are contemplating not keeping their children. Maybe they don't even have a home. Maybe they don't have support. Maybe their mom, of all people, is telling them, there's no way you can raise that baby. And this is a ministry that specifically reaches those girls to tell them, there's good reason to keep that child. 
might not have come into this earth in the most uh, perfect circumstances. You might not have planned it. It might not be, you know, the person that you're married to and all these different kind of things. In fact, you might not even know who the dad is. And there might be all these different circumstances surrounding that. But that life is worth keeping. And so the ministry uh, is a ministry that, that comes along and provides goods for these young ladies, provides diapers, uh, strollers, provides education and encouragement to say it is doable. It's going to be hard, but it's doable. And we want to come alongside you because we believe that child and that life that's forming in you is valuable. But the reason why I bring that story to our attention, that local story, is because here what we find is this young girl who probably had, just like all of us, plans for her life. We all have plans, don't we? We have thoughts, we have ideas, you know, we, we have dreams, we want to do this, that, and the other. Some of us are more planners than others, some of us know uh, exactly what we want in the next five to ten years, others are kind of, you know, more uh, easygoing, whatever happens, happens, um, but nevertheless, we all have dreams, wishes, desires, and ideas of how things could pan out. For our young people, oh, I want to transfer from this college to that college, graduate with this degree, and maybe I want to do this profession. For our adults, we, we're, you know, many of us think, I'm, I'm working in this place, but I'd love to get here, and that's my goal in the next 10 years, and I'm going to work hard to get to that place. Some of us have family goals, and, and there, I know there are some who are newly married here at church, and you might be thinking to yourself, maybe in about three or four years, we might want to try and start a family of our own. And, and, and if you're like me, it's easy for me to start flash-forwarding and start thinking about the things that I want to see, right? The plans that I would love to see. I, I get so excited. Sometimes I have to slow myself down and just enjoy the moment because I get so excited. I'm a, I'm a sports freak. If Many of you know that a lot of our pastors here are, are uh, former athletes, but I can't wait. I, I go and help my son play t-ball, and I could already envision him hitting home runs in high school, right? I could envision him rounding the bases, you know, that kind of thing. Right, I'm probably in the stand yelling. My dad's yelling louder than me, right next to me. Right, uh, I could already envision that kind of. I have to slow myself down and really say, "Hold on, one second, man. Enjoy the swing and misses at the t-ball field, okay?" And and you know how funny it is for his jersey. You know, it's 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 not a long sleeve shirt, but it comes down to his wrist. I don't know how that works, but um, you know. But I get really excited, dreaming and thinking about these plans, and and I, and I can only help. Uh, but to imagine that Mary had plans as well, that she had thoughts, that she might have thought, you know, okay, well, you know, Joseph and I have been dating for, for a while, and, and maybe at this date we'll, we'll, we'll be married, and, and then we'll have a family, and, and we'll, this is what things might look like. And then all of a sudden, right at this stage in her life, she is visited by an angel that tells her, change of plans, Mary. Change of plans, Mary. Here are the plans for your life. And many of us do not like that narrative. Many of us are like, no, wait a second, Pastor Koba, do not make that parallel. Let's let this be Mary's story because as far as I go, I want to have control over my own plans. And yet Mary's response initially was, I am your servant. Whatever it is that you want to do, I'm willing. So she willingly responds to God's call upon her life. Notice that it's a call. Can somebody say it's a call? Think about that. How would you feel? All right. I mean, each of your children and my children that I have uh, at home, each of them are a gift from the Lord. They're, they're a treasure. I, I see my children as God's children. And so when I think about the privilege it is to raise them, uh, I, I remember, how, I, I'm thinking about how amazing it is that God would say, I trust you to raise my kid. Imagine that. Imagine Heavenly Father comes, drops those children off at your home and says, here you go. Teach them the right ways, right? Discipline them when they need it. Uh, build up in them a, a, a spirit of hope, joy, faith. Teach them what it means to love me and to know me. And these are the responsibilities that we have as parents. And so think about the response, if that's a big responsibility in and of itself, now imagine that, but multiply it times 10,000 because God wants you to raise his own son, Jesus. Now, I could, you know, if I were thinking like a rational person here, and if I were, you know, if I put a think, if God put me in charge to create a think tank as to what would be the best way to bring the Savior into the world, I would have a lot of different suggestions for God. 
right? I would say, okay, Lord, well, you're, you're going to bring your own son, Jesus, so why don't we choose uh, a rabbi and his wife because they'll be able to instruct your son in the right ways. Why don't we choose someone who is of noble birth so that when Jesus comes of age, then he'll be ready to be a rightful king and to oversee Israel and to be a true king of Israel. That, you know, my earthly standpoint would start creating all these ideas as to how there could be somebody better, but yet Jesus chose Mary. Teenager, unmarried, not the perfect circumstances. And she responded humbly, she responded willingly, and she said, Lord, let it be unto me as you wish. But as we get into this, it's called a song, Mary's song, the Magnificat. It very looks, it sounds very similarly to other songs that we've seen in Scripture. Other songs that we've seen in Scripture, we see a song from Hannah, who was the mother of Samuel, that prayed when she was barren that she would have a child and and declared to God that if God gave her a child, that she would return her son into the service of God. And so Samuel, the prophet, was raised uh, in the house of the Lord because uh, the Lord gave Hannah a son that she had prayed for. And when the Lord responded and when the Lord answered her prayer, she sang a song. We remember Miriam's song when God delivered his people, Israel, from Egypt, that she sang a song. And again, now we see when Mary receives this news that she sings a song unto our God. And it's a powerful song. And I think it continues to drive home the reason as to why God would choose this young girl named Mary. And there's a lot we can learn from Mary. In the Protestant Christian church, we uh, sometimes tend to, uh, to, to sway so far away from a Catholic understanding of Mary that we can almost sometimes, unfortunately, uh, give her a bad reputation. We can sometimes uh, overly minimize her role in the gospel narrative. We don't worship Mary here at this church. We don't even pray to Mary here at this church. But we can be thankful and learn from her. Right? We can honor who she is and the reason why God chose her to be the carrier of the Savior of the world. So let's look at her response. And I believe there are aspects of this response that both remind us why she was chosen and then give us uh, some great instruction as to what kind of heart we should have right now. So it says, my soul, Mary, in verse 46, my soul. Soul magnifies the Lord. Somebody say magnify the Lord. Magnify. What does the word magnify mean? The word magnify. Good, I get some responses. I, I, I see some hand gestures and some, some uh, audible responses. It, what does it mean? To magnify what? Means to? Enlarge means to make bigger, to magnify. So Mary's first line, right out of the gate, she gets this news, and her first response to God is, my soul magnifies the Lord. Soul is a very important phrase here. She's not saying my mind magnifies the Lord. She's not saying my emotions magnify the Lord. She's not saying anything superficial that magnifies the Lord, my hands, because all of these things are, are true, and I'm sure that in this posture, she was probably emotionally responding to this message, but deeper than an emotional response and deeper than an intellectual response, she says, my entire being, the essence of my being, which is the, the word for soul in Scripture, Hebrew nefesh, Greek suke, everything that I am, the core of who I am, magnifies the Lord. She's giving God praise. Her response to this message is to worship God. She broke out into a worship song. Right? That's why it's so important for us to think about incorporating Worship songs and theological and prayer vocabulary into our lives because we are surrounded by language and vocabulary that teaches us to complain. But if we surround ourselves and if we're full and saturated of worship language and love language toward God, then when moments like this happen, we're ready. And her first line out of the gate is, I'm going to magnify the Lord with my soul. I can't help but to. It wasn't a, a response that started with uh, 
Lord, are you, are, are you sure? Because can you wait like 10 years and then bring the Savior? Because that would be better for me and my plans. That would work out better in my situation if you just did it this way, God. Are you okay if I revise your plans, Lord? And sometimes our lives are like that. Sometimes our responses are like that. We want all the benefits of God short of fully surrendering unto him. God, can you just make my life a little bit better? Would that be okay? Mary's response had nothing to do with her life. Mary's response had zero to do with her plans. Mary's response was, God, this is what you want. Lord, go ahead and do it. And in fact, I am honored to carry, to be a vessel of your grace and your mercy in this way. And I am going to magnify you. I'm going to make you bigger. Now, I don't know if it's possible to make the Lord bigger. Do you get what I'm saying? I don't know if it's possible to magnify someone who's as big as the Lord is. But here's the deal. By her saying, my soul magnifies the Lord, I think it reminds us that even though God is who he is, he loves to be who he is in our heart. Just because God is great, just because God is awesome, doesn't mean that you are living and responding to a God who is awesome and great. Just because God is loving doesn't mean that you are experiencing and declaring that you serve a loving God. So when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, what she's saying here is, God, you're already big, but I'm going to make sure that you are made even bigger. She says, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty, somebody say mighty, mighty. has done great things for me. Oh man, so, so I'm, I'm getting more and more convinced. If this were my first time looking at this passage, I'm getting more and more convinced that Mary was the right choice. Hallelujah. Step one, she worshiped God. Right? Step two, she's connected to the spirit of the prophets and to theology that stems all the way back to the beginning of Scripture that our God is the God who looks out for those who others have regarded as lowly. So in other words, she is demonstrating an accurate understanding of who God is and how God works. Then she says, right, she taps into some history. She says, um, all generations will call me blessed. And then she says, for the God who is mighty, I love that, Right? He who is mighty has done great things for me. No, those are two separate concepts that she brought together. Because she's saying, the one who is mighty, because I've heard about this God. I mean, I grew up listening to stories about this God. I mean, he, he helped David kill Goliath. He, he split the Red Sea. This God has done some amazing things. But not only is he now a God who has done amazing things, but I'm experiencing those amazing things in my own life. That's called a testimony, church. A testimony is, I've heard that he's good, but now I'm going to tell you that he is good. I've heard that he's able, but now I'm experiencing that he's able. I've seen what he's done for someone else, but now he's doing it for me. I didn't know if it was possible, but now I'm seeing firsthand that the God who everybody said is mighty is actually mighty, and I'm going to make sure that people hear about it. A little teenage girl, pregnant, confused, not married, responding in this way. Now, this reminds me that there are times in our lives when in our own faith we might find growth spurts. We might find moments when we are growing in the Lord, where we're growing in boldness, when we're growing in, in ways that we are making God known to others, where we're able to articulate how good he is and what he's done in our lives. But then all of a sudden the enemy finds ways to poke at us and to find our weak spots and our insecurities to hold us back from truly proclaiming who God is and what he's doing in our life. We might say something like, oh, man. But then if I open my mouth about God now, then they're going to hold me accountable later. I don't know if I want all that. So I'm going to keep my church life over here real nice and tidy. And I'm going to keep my home life here. And I'm going to keep my friendships and what I do on Fridays and Saturday nights over here. And I don't want them to intermix. We, we might, there might be areas where all of a sudden the enemy begins to identify weaknesses and insecurities in us. I mean, if you think about it, she, was, uh, she had no lack of reasons as to why she should not go along with this plan. 
I'm surprised that there wasn't a longer dialogue there. I'm surprised that there wasn't a, man, aren't people going to think that, that I got knocked up by somebody who I'm not even married to? What's my parents going to think? What's society going to think? Are they going to accept me? What, what are they going to think when all of a sudden, right, the baby bump starts to turn a little bit more into, you know, a nice watermelon looking thing? Well, I can't hide it at that point. What am I going to do then? Can I even go out in public? Am I going to have to stay at home? Do I need to move away? If you think about all the questions that she might have been asking, because, you know, we as humans are often thinking about the, the implications for us and, and what these things mean for us. And yet I love the fact that in her response so far, she has made her response about God. She's made her response about the Lord. And so she's proving again through this that, that she was the first round draft pick for a reason. She goes, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Somebody say, for me. Because see, if for me wasn't in there, it wouldn't have been personalized just yet. If, if she would have just said, for he, was done great, uh, for he who is mighty has done great things, we would say, true. That's true. right? But then it becomes even more powerful when she adds in, for me. What has the Lord done for you, church? What has he done for you in your life? What has he done in your heart? What has he done in your home? What has he done in, in your sphere, in your family? I don't know about you, but I could point to some amazing things that God has done. But when we all of a sudden can tie it back and say, he's done great things for me, okay, now it's turning into a testimony. Then she continues in 49, and holy is his name. Man, she's got it down, right? Then here's another great part. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Now she's preaching, church. Right? She, she turned this into a worship song, into a sermon all of a sudden. She's starting to say, if anybody in here needs mercy, there's a God who has mercy. And it's available from generation to generation. I'm like, okay, Mary. There we go. Imagine that. Jesus is going to be a little baby. He's going to be two, three years old, a little knucklehead, right? I doubt he was a perfect baby. Okay? I don't know. I mean, maybe some of you have different beliefs than me. Maybe you think, you know, he walked around like the medieval images of the infant Jesus or the 12-year-old Jesus with the halo around his head. But I, 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 human nature causes me to think differently. I don't think he sinned, but I don't think he was some, you know, perfect child right first of all he disobeyed his parents do you remember that story if we fast forward about 12 years and they're walking and they go to jerusalem to the temple and then all of a sudden he's nowhere to be found i mean what 12 year old just pieces out doesn't tell their parents right where he's going and doesn't even send them a text right not even like a text like hey mom dad i'm going over here real quick to kick it with the you know the uh, pharisees and the scribes to discuss the torah with them and i'll be back in a little while right he didn't even give them a heads up right and so all that to say they were looking for him like where did he go where where are so, so all that to say is we know that you know there was there was at least some indication that he probably wasn't the perfect child but mary as his mom Think about 20, 21-year-old Mary as Jesus is three, four years old, right, raising him up, teaching him the things that we're reading about in her response to God, teaching him that, that the God, your father, is a God of mercy, and he shows compassion to those who fear him. And there might be some folks in here this morning that you might be in a situation where, where this one line right here is preaching to you. For 2,000 years ago, Mary is reaching through the text to remind you the, the mother of Jesus is reaching through the text to remind you that mercy is available for you today. Mercy is a beautiful thing. Mercy is a wonderful thing. Mercy is at the heart of forgiveness, and forgiveness is the only thing that can restore that which is broken in the world that we live in. There might be some relationships where there's lack of forgiveness right now that you're in. There might be some households right now that are, are, are established on the foundation and principles of, of, of reciprocity and giving people what they deserve as opposed to demonstrating mercy when mercy is needed. How many of us know that if mercy does not jump in to our situations and moments where re reconciliation is needed, then there's no hope for true mending to happen? When we live in our relationships where we say, I'm, you're going to get what you deserve. You treated me like that, I'm going to treat you like that. 
You said to me, you talk to me like that, I'm going to talk to you like that. Think about that. Think about, uh, you know, and I'm, this is not a parenting workshop or anything this morning, but our children talk the way we talk. So if you're correcting them for having a bad response, well, guess where they learned it? Right? So even when we correct them, we could correct them in ways that teach them how to respond in the right ways. Right? It's funny because, I, you know, I see my son. He's four. My daughter's two. Right? It's funny to see, you know, my, my daughter do something to my son, my two-year-old do something to my four-year-old, right? And then watch my four-year-old start correcting her, right, and start scolding her, that kind of thing. I'm like, hey, he kind of sounds like me right there, and I don't know if I like it. Joseph, don't talk to your sister like that. Oh, wait. I just taught him that. So, so, so even thinking about the ways that we operate, and so as we reflect on that, as we reflect on all of these things, we, we're reminded that when, when we are dealing with this, this passage that Mary says, mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. We desire that mercy. We desire these things to come on in. We could be reminded in this moment that for those who fear him, so if you're here and you fear the Lord, you respect the Lord, you reverence the Lord, you love the Lord, you worship the Lord, then mercy is available for you. Mercy is available for you. Not shame, not guilt, mercy. Not hopelessness, not lostness, not despair, but mercy. Mercy is on those who fear him from generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud, the imagination of their hearts, put down the mighty from their thrones. He's exalted the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things. Man, Mary for president, man. Look at all these. She's... She's got some ideas in here, doesn't she? The rich he sent away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And then she taps right back in to history. And we find this response, this song unto the Lord called the Magnificat, demonstrating the heart of Mary. The heart of Mary. Responding to God. So I want to ask you this question. Now, after, now that we've studied a little bit about Mary, we've studied her response, we've studied the circumstances that led to this situation, I want to ask you, how are you receiving Jesus? Have you received Jesus like Mary received Jesus? Graciously, humbly, ready. She was filled with the word of God. She was filled with prayer. The Holy Spirit was upon her. And when she received this news, she responded in the right way. How have you and are you receiving the news of Jesus right now? Is the news of Jesus filling your home? Is the news of Jesus filling your life, your car, your commute to work, your, your existence at work, your relationships in your family and with your friendships, your marriages? Is the news of Jesus being responded to in a similar fashion? As I mentioned before, there's a number of ways that we can, we can opt to recreate this scenario and respond in ways that Mary easily could have. Instead, we find a young woman who was faithful, who was grateful, who was grateful. She, her soul magnifies the Lord. As we think about these next few weeks, we've got a couple more weeks as we lead up to Christmas and, and the announcement that Jesus is coming. That Jesus is coming. The advent simply means the coming of our Lord. How do we receive that news? My prayer is that we receive that news with joy. With great joy. That the Savior, Jesus, is coming to be born. That the lost have something to be hopeful in. That those who are low or considered low are considered and lifted up. That those who might not see themselves as blessed would be considered blessed. And there's the hard word reminder in here too, if there's anyone in here. If there's anyone in here that, that falls into the other category that, that Mary calls out. A few times in her song, she says, he has scattered the proud. She says, he's, and the rich he, is, he has sent away empty. There's the other mention that she brings here for those who think they're too good for God. 
Oh, I got everything I need. When she talks about the proud, the rich, the mighty, she's talking about those who, by virtue of their own efforts, their own work, feel like uh, you know this announcement of a baby to be born in Bethlehem means nothing because there's really not much that I need. And if I don't need anything, why should I be so excited about this new baby that's coming to be born to bring whatever it is that he's bringing? For those who are unwilling to admit and recognize sin and brokenness, patterns of of pride, arrogance, patterns of, of sin, and, 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 uh, and thinking that there, there is nothing really I could benefit or gain from this. Mary says, watch out. Be careful. Be careful for those who are self-sufficient. Be careful to those who think they got it all figured out. And this is a message that's not just for for non-believers, but even for those of us who have been in the church and we've been born and raised and we feel like we've gotten things down and, and we have, our, our, uh, we have our, our system, we know when we got to go to church and how to read our scriptures, but in our heart we haven't opened up a place to receive this message in the way that Mary has. She gives a word, a, a stern warning that says, be careful. Because God has a way of bringing down those who are high and lifting up those who are low. So as we prepare to conclude, and as we think about Mary's response in this passage, we read all the way back from the moment when she found out to connecting with her cousin Elizabeth to share this moment, all the way now to this place where we've seen her response. Not only is it a reminder to us as to why she was a fitting person to carry. She was a fitting uh, vessel, but it's a reminder to us, how do we receive the news of the Lord? Jesus?